Great. Well, thanks everyone for coming to this panel today. We're talking about uh, protecting kids on the internet, um, protecting them, uh, their safety and protecting uh, their privacy. So uh, I'm Lauren Finer. I report on tech policy for CNBC.com where I cover a lot of these issues. Um, and it's an area where I think a lot of people, pretty much everyone agrees on the value of keeping kids safe online. But in terms of how exactly to do that effectively and practically, that's where there's room for discussion. Um, so we're going to dive into a lot of these questions today. Um, and I'm going to just let everyone go down the line and introduce themselves and maybe just say a brief sentence about um, your background in this space or the uh, policies that you're following. Sure. My name is Natalie Campbell. I'm TV Director for North American Government and Regulatory Affairs as the Internet Society. Um, another off track of my background that's relevant to this conversation is that I used to be a trustee on a school board based in Tano's North Cliff territory and also long as a eight year old and I'm loving now. Okay. Hi, Katrina Fitzgerald. I'm Deputy Director of the Electronic Privacy Information Center, or EPIC. Uh, EPIC has been around for almost 30 years. Uh, defending the fundamental right to privacy in the digital age for people of all ages, <laughs> all Americans. Um, we, you know, we were involved when COPPA was passed, the last time Congress passed a privacy law to keep kids safe online 25 years ago. Uh, and, uh, you know, following what's happening in Congress with the Kids Online Safety Act, COPPA 2.0, and the American Data Privacy and Protection Act, and also involved in states where you're looking at age-appropriate design codes. Hello everyone, I'm Dio Sims. I'm a privacy counsel at TikTok. Um, prior to working at TikTok, I worked um, for three US federal government agencies, SSA, Treasury, and Department of Homeland Security. After that, I went to Uber, and about two and a half years ago, I joined TikTok. Um, I work on privacy issues uh, in, the, in the US public policy team. I've been following a lot of the developments, and then I work with our product and en engineering teams to come up with solutions that are of forward looking. Um, and so I'm happy to be speaking with you all today. Hi, I'm Jane Horvath. I'm a partner at Gibson Dunn. And prior to this, for the last 11 years, I was the chief privacy officer at Apple. Hi, I'm Jamie Suskin. I am tech policy advisor for Senator Marsha Blackburn from Tennessee. Um, I oversee the senator's work on the Commerce Committee, including the Consumer Protection Subcommittee, which includes privacy and data security issues. And I was the primary staffer on uh, COSA and sort of managing the privacy issues for the senator. And you all are lucky because my almost six-year-old wanted to come today and I was able to hand her off to her dad. <laughs> <laughs> well, thanks everybody. Um, to kick things off, I thought we could just first kind of go over some of the key pieces of legislation in this area. Um, so, Jamie, I was going to kick it to you to talk a little bit about the Kids Online Safety Act. Could you tell us a little bit about what that legislation does, um, where it is, and, you know, how it fits into this sure. greater uh, theme? Yep, happy to. Um, so, the Kids Online Safety Act, Senator Blackburn introduced with Senator Blumenthal from Connecticut um, about a year ago, and that followed five hearings they had had in their subcommittee on the Commerce Committee about harms to kids and teens online. Um, those hearings had had both uh, academics and researchers and industry representatives from different con uh, different companies. And after that, the COSA legislation was basically the culmination of the things that they had found after those hearings. So we have not yet reintroduced it here in the 118th. Um, I wouldn't take anything from that because it's just taking some time to get the final text ready. Um, we have new leadership on the Commerce Committee and Senator Cruz, and we just want to work with um, him and Senator Cantwall to sort of make sure the product is the best it can be so we don't have to have, um, you know, a big, long, protracted markup process. So last year, the bill was voted out of the Commerce Committee 28 to 0. We're hopeful for a similar result this year. Um, Basically, what the bill does is it would require covered platforms to create uh, what we call safety by default. And so in our view, this picks up where COPPA leaves off. Um, COPPA, which probably since you're in this room, most of you know that, is the notice and consent regime for um, kids and teens to get online. It cuts off at age 13 is where 
it would begin. And so, you know, basically what we have come to learn is that, you know, Papa has its um, its good points and it has its bad points. But at the end of the day, simply a notice and consent regime for kids and teens isn't preventing a lot of the harms that we're seeing. Um, and so, you know, happy to talk with our fellow panelists about that, but we need to be doing more. And so that's what COSA looks to do. Great. And then just to give us an overview of some of the other uh, legislation on the table, Katrina, would you be able to tell us a little bit about the efforts to revise CAFA? And I think you also looked into the California Age Appropriate Design Code. Yeah, sure. So, you know, also CAFA 2.0, as I mean, Marty and um, Tids Pidesiath on the House side, we both all that stuff in uh, I'd love to update God bless the lady, you know, of her team to like a hop own rather than the team. Uh, and um, you know, the French hope they did that, the tide didn't kick in. So they go, they tell further than the notice and consent hall, but they're focused on, on privacy and data collection end of thing, more and more the design pieces. And then in California, they test age of public design code uh, last session following the model that came out of the UK. Um, it's, you know, I think that's the same pain disclosure, but it goes about it a little bit in a different way. It focuses more on the like, data practices that are driving uh, business decisions. Uh, the ever keeping we keep the line when uh, the, the cotton tarns online. So it quiets companies to do data protection impact assessments that look at what harms are coming from the data practices and then what price companies can make uh, in time if poor shades are Great, great. And, you know, I think when it comes to these kind of discussions, it we end up talking a lot about how will it actually look to implement these kinds of policies. So, Dio, I wanted to ask you a little bit about as someone in the industry, you know, looking at this legislation, what are your concerns or what do you see as the challenges in trying to implement some of these uh, legislations that aim to protect kids online? Um, so I think what we try to do at TikTok is look at, I guess, the overall trends and what these legislate what this legislation is trying to do. Um, and so we look to implement some of these things in advance because they're happening in like a piecemeal fashion. So in the UK, you have AADC. In California, there's AADC, but you know there isn't a national bill that protects teens beyond the age of 12. Um, and so we're kind of thinking about um, how do we build in default protections. So for example, at TikTok, we've thought about ways to, we thought about children's development. So from 13 to 15, we believe that teens need a lot more handholding and guardrails. So we make their accounts private by default. Um, we think about ways to implement default um, time limitations on how much time they can use. So just last weekend, we announced um, that there will be 60 minute time limits, screen time limitations, and then we also rolled out a suite of additional tools to add to our family pairing feature, which um, is actually kind of consistent with um, COSA's uh, parental controls um, uh, provisions. Um, so we've been thinking about ways to look at this legislation, apply it broadly across our community of teen users, um, think about um, you know how much handholding they need, um, implement those things um, and then continue to monitor as developments come up. Yeah, I think something interesting that you brought up there is like looking at the different age brackets of users and seeing, you know, if they might need different um, levels of handholding um, and privacy protections. So does anyone want to speak to how we might think about um, different ages of minors and, you know, if they should have different kinds of protections or different kinds of defaults depending on their actual age bracket. I can add a little color and then sure. everybody else can chime in. Um, so we've been thinking about it from 13 to 15. We've added a, a lot of additional protections. So for example, you can't DM um, on TikTok if you are under 16. And the reason we do that is because we know that there is some grooming activity and behavior that happens in direct messaging. And we want to safeguard teens from being groomed online. Um, and so th those are some of the things we do. And then at 16, we understand and we work with um, child safety experts and adolescent development experts to kind of think about this in this way. Um, but, you know, at 16, you start to make a little bit more decisions about how you want to be online, who you are, um, how you want to spend time. But then we still provide tooling 
for parents to work with their teams to make decisions around what's appropriate for them, whether it's screen time, whether it's the content they look at. I think there's a number of different people that are involved in, in designing this kind of experience. And so we partner with parents and, and other organizations. Does anyone else want to speak to that? I'm happy to just speak quickly. Um, I, I, I think I applaud all of the efforts to increase the delta between 13 and 18 and to protect children. But I think that we also need to be looking at an omnibus privacy law because your question was, should we be looking at different levels of privacy protection for children? Everybody in this country needs a fundamental level of protection in this country. So, I, and I'm not saying we should do either or, but we really also need to be focused on making sure every citizen in, in the country has privacy protections, because I applaud the states who have enacted privacy laws but there are a lot of citizens in this country that right now do not have a state level privacy law. So I think that would end up protecting kids' privacy as well. And it would educate their parents because a lot of the problems that we have right now is we have children who are digital natives and, um, and parents who, for some of them, have no knowledge. I mean, yes, maybe they're carrying a mobile phone around but they have very little knowledge about what they're doing online. But kids know more than they do. And, you know, I, I go back to thinking about COPPA compliance and verified parental consent. Um, that was a real challenge with children that are digital natives and parents who, who were not digital natives as we were uh, doing that when I was at Apple. We just, I'm allowed, you know, I couldn't agree more that we need a, a comprehensive privacy bill. And I'd say, you know, I think sometimes the complications with determining users' ages online can be used as a crutch to not pass privacy regulations. And um, it shouldn't be because the, I think the best thing we can do to protect kids online, it, it doesn't require it, it requires changing the harmful business practices that are positive, you know, resulting in endless data collection, that would protect us all, but it would do a lot for kids because so much of the addiction and so much of uh, the harmful practice, the harmful things that are happening in my mind are driven by that. So, Ursul, I'll be thinking, I'm saying not the I agree with that, see, and um, so a couple things, and leave that, number one, when we love you, Co said, or she could love, we let to look at it as something as not just a privacy bill. And so I think using the, the name of this kit along, I mean, it's headland. But it does, it's, as I say, it's more about safety by design than some of that deals with data collection, but a lot of that deals with things called beyond grade, because when you're looking at how an algorithm is just on that, she can send to chance with that suicide content and that's, you know, self targeted the anchor concept content that goes well beyond the data that is collected because, you know, it's possible that you've never been looking for that information and suddenly you still fall across at no anyway. So that goes beyond just the native fletches. Um, I think it also does us, frankly, a disservice to say, well, if you do something that focuses on just kids and teens, you can never get how pets to privacy reform. No, I literally sat here a year ago and I think we said the same thing. The pile, you know, Senator Blackford has been a vocal, vocal supporter of getting a pet's pets privacy all done, but Opsie, so Air Cruz, he pops under Cam. Well, I think you know we get the response. It is like the back of us. I think they all want to be read, but that doesn't mean you can't do this. And I don't think that that means that. Yeah, I think you do this, you can never get top pants done. Cut through it is hard, and it's hard to reply reasons, but yeah. And does it make it harder to get comprehensive privacy done? Upsetting to us, you know, something that deals with Jin's online safety is a. Uh, it's its own conversation, right? And I don't believe that it takes a ray at all from the end of that wall to try to get you on comprehensive. But, you know, people without, frankly, at the end of the year last year, right? Tosa didn't boo, Papa 2.0 didn't boo, I see Tosa still didn't get in more near off the finish line. You know, they don't disrespect for the house without other chiefs under for frying. But, you know, even with those out of the conversation, uh, it, it didn't but it was so, you know, we feel like we can have all those conversations, we can walk and she on. So we shouldn't let that stop this. Can that one? It works. Good. 
So I want to share a little bit about, first of all, how the Internet Society looks at these issues of child safety and privacy online. Um, so the Internet Society, uh, our mission is to make sure that the Internet is for everyone. And that means everyone. And there's two kind of facets to that. There's, you know, growing the Internet to make sure that everyone who wants it can have it. But then there's also protecting and defending the Internet and not just any Internet, but one that is open, globally connected, secure and trustworthy. How do you do that? How can we know for sure and analyze whether bills are living up to this aspirational state of the internet? This is where we developed an internet impact assessment toolkit. And so anytime we um, flag any of these kinds of bills and have concerns, we run it through this analysis to see if is this hindering, you know, an open, globally connected, secure and trustworthy internet. And this is how we know whether this is getting um, in the way of our mission, which also happens to be what a lot of countries committed to upholding in the Freedom Online Coalition. So that said, when we look at um, things like privacy, privacy is a really crucial thing for a trustworthy and secure internet. So privacy for everyone is something that is a good thing for the internet. But where we start to see concerns is when we talk about things like age verification, because that could it could kind of, um, I'm looking for the word, it only comes up in French. It can undermine our efforts of privacy, right? If we're asking platforms to collect more information that they might, other, other, might otherwise not collect. Um, and then another thing that we spot in some of these privacy and safety bills um, is that sometimes they, they ask platforms to do content moderation and takedowns. And some platforms already have really great content moderation policies, but if you're forcing platforms to do this and forcing platforms that are, let's say, end-to-end -end encrypted messaging platforms, then that undermines security online. And that's where we get further from this as aspirational state of the internet, the secure and trustworthy. Yeah, I mean, so I'm curious, based on this discussion, would any of you make the argument that this whole discussion around kids online safety legislation is maybe somewhat misguided. You know, is it that we, uh, you know, these are well-intentioned goals, but that really we should be focusing at a more fundamental level on comprehensive privacy or incentives of these business models or things like that? Could I? I actually wanted to read from the latest draft of COSA if this is helpful. Nothing in this division shall be construed to require the affirmative collection of any personal data with respect to the age of users that a covered platform is not already collecting in the normal course of business or a covered platform to implement an age gating functionality. So I think that's pretty clear that we're not asking for that. And, um, you know, once again, with respect to the research you guys are doing, I have, you know, that's great. But, uh, you know, I don't think that it gives us concern if we hear that, you know, platforms are really struggling with this and they don't know how to do it because COPPA has been the law for a long time. And if platforms don't know how to do that, then there's bigger problems and they probably should be talking to the FTC about it. You could change. Do you want to jump in there? <laughs> yeah, uh, you know, just to your question, I, yeah. I think we can do both. I think, you know, and that's what the American Data Privacy and Protection Act does. It you know, sets comprehensive privacy protections for everyone. It sets a data minimization standard that says companies have to stop collecting limitless amounts of data. The data they're collecting should be necessary for the purpose we're asking for, you know, with some, some enumerated exceptions because not everything fits in that box. But then it also has heightened protections for kids. It says kids' data is what's considered sensitive. So it has to be strictly necessary for the purpose you're, you're using it for. Um, it bans targeted advertising to kids. It creates a youth marketing division at the FTC. So I think we can do both. I mean, I don't think there's anyone in this room that thinks uh, we don't need to do something about kids online, that, you know, that you know, the kids are not all right. This is, we need to do something. Um, and you can't, we can't put it up to parents. You know, I'm a privacy advocate and I, my eight-year-old, you know, I can limit what I can on her device that we do at home. But at school, they're on apps that I would never allow at home. In middle school, she's going to be given a district-issued device, and I've heard from parents in the middle school that they are not allowed to disable YouTube because teachers, you know, assign YouTube videos. So there's no way to disable YouTube on these district devices, um, and kids are just watching YouTube while they're supposed to be doing their homework. So, like, even the most educated parents 
can't limit these things. It needs to be changes to the business practices. Yeah. I would also want to just speak to that. I know. No, I think that's what I was saying. I think um, I would agree that legislation needs to happen. It can be got the mortgage and broadly for all Americans. Oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> um, so I was just saying I agree. I think there are num a number of different people who have a role to play here. Legislators, for example, have a role to play here. So, you know, I, I totally agree that legislation should be passed. I also agree that parents and platforms have a responsibility. So. Yeah. So I think we touched a little bit on uh, age verification. Um, and, and Jamie, I appreciate you bringing up that point in, in COSA. Um, but when it comes to just like the specifics of age verification, because I know there's a lot of different legis pieces of legislation um, across states, across countries um, where age verification might come into play. So um, how is there are there ways to be sure or pretty sure about a, someone's a user's age without infringing on their privacy? I, I think that is probably the, the biggest question is how do you verify you're on a terminal they're on a terminal you can't look at them you you really rely on an age gate right now um we haven't come up with a better thing right now it's when you're signing up for an account enter your age well i have a now 25 year old who's 26 on facebook because he had figured this out, wanted to get on early. This is a long, long time. <laughs> and he's 25, so this was before he was 13. But I think that is the harder thing. When you use the term verification, it implies that you actually know how old they are. And so when I think in terms of that, it, it really thinks, even though, and thanks for the clarification, COSA says you don't have to collect additional information. It's hard to understand how you're going to meet the standard of a verification without actually collecting some kind of official uh, age document, like a birth certificate. So I just add at TikTok, we have a neutral age gate. So we ask for birthday. Um, you can't change your birthday once you find out that, you know, the sum settings don't apply to you. Um, and there are some challenges. I think what we do is if we find that a teen has lied, we remove their account. Um, we've had to remove over 60 million accounts globally last year alone um, because, you know, people say that they're, you know, 16 and then they say in their profile that they're doing their third grade project. And, and in those cases, I mean, people say kids are savvy, but they're not that savvy. They give a lot, you know, they give some things away and when they do, um, we have to, we have the responsibility of taking that down, but you know, um, to your point, and even to the point on COSA, you know, there's a there's a provision in COSA that says, um, you know, that they want to conduct a study about how to do age verification, maybe at the platform or at the device level. I think, you know, as there are going to be a lot of apps that come up over the course. You mentioned there are apps that your kid, you don't even know <laughs> what apps your kid is going to see on this state-owned device. Um, so I think there are going to be continuous new apps that are popping up and without some kind of centralized way to say this is an 11 year old's phone and platforms can then take that information um, and, and do a better job of making sure that we're protecting teens. Yeah, so, so that's an interesting point is like maybe the verification needs to be at the, uh, the level of the device. And so Jane, maybe you could talk a little bit to that about are there ex other challenges in verifying age on a device in a way that could be applied to um, uh, other apps that are on that device. I mean, I, again, a, a, a huge issue. If you're you're talking about one device, but a lot of families, a lot of people have multiple devices. So, on what device are we looking at? And you have maybe their school device or this device. And maybe that the school device would be the right way to look, but not everybody has a school device. So, I think the using the device as a source of truth is again difficult because you might have shared devices i mean you look at apple tv and then you know, there's different accounts that are signed up you can switch accounts and so there's no one account one-to-one -one correlation between a device and account 
And I think this is a situation where legislation can drive innovation, right? Companies will figure this out if we require them to figure it out. They love innovating. They tell us they love innovating. Um, so, you know, is there a good system now? No. The French Data Protection Agency did a report last year saying, no, there's not a good way to do age verification now. But I'm confident that if we had legislation that required it, and they do, and you, um, but, and they're in the process of figuring out. Um, one thing the California Age Appropriate Design Code does is talk a little bit, is focus more on what they call age assurance rather than age verification. So it's kind of like having a good idea of what age-ish the user is, um, and then putting in appropriate safeguards based on the risk of the product that you're dealing with. So, you know, it's like a social media company, you want to be a little more sure than if it's, you know, a web research website or something like that. Yeah. Uh, so, I mean, wh what do folks on the panel think about this, the idea of age assurance? Is that just the best that we can do right now? Is there, should we aim for age verification or does that implicate too much data um, to want to go there? Yes. <laughs> well, I think the bottom line is that there's no for sure way to do it, right? There's no reliable way right now to do age verification and whether we're doing it by facial recognition or we're asking a bunch of intrusive questions, it's still generating more sensitive data, which undermines their goals of privacy. So as far as legislatively goes, I mean, I think that we're open to the conversation. I don't think you know, my boss is not, and I've talked to her about this, right? She's not going to support the world in which you provide a government ID card to get on an app. Like, that is not, that's not what we want to do here. Um, but, you know, I think a second question is, you know, are the platforms going to be incentivized to remove these folks, right? And, you know, sorry to be hitting Instagram, who's not on this panel and can't come back, but... When we had had one of our hearings in the subcommittee last year, they said, oh, but we removed 800,000 underage accounts. But then at the same time, we saw articles where they were having um, kids who were old enough to be on the platform recruiting their siblings who were not. And that was in the news. So I'm going to assume that that, you know, is probably true because there were interviews with the company. So are the companies going to be incentivized to actually remove the folks? You know, if that's the case, sure, age assurance is feasible because nobody's ever going to be perfect. Um, but there also has to be some give and take. Yeah. So when it comes to just the realities of implementing these kinds of regulations, um, is there anything that anyone here would say um, legislator, legislators and regulators don't seem to understand about the complexities in these issues and, you know, maybe unintended consequences that could happen as a result of them? I don't like to give them that excuse. I think that that just, you know, it's just another excuse to not pass <laughs> privacy legislation or pass kids' idle on safety uh, legislation. There's plenty of expertise in Congress. Uh, they can get this done. It's just a matter of will. I think one thing that concerns us at the Internet Society is when certain bills ask platforms to take reasonable measures to take down and moderate moderate and take down what could be harmful content. One of the complexities with this is it's really hard to tell what is harmful content and education that might be trying to mitigate harmful content. And I can give like a really good example of this. When I was in Canada's Northwest Territories, which is large, vast geography of mostly remote communities and indigenous communities, they face disproportionate rates of suicide compared to the rest of the country. It is really tragic. But there's this group of kids that started a really great campaign called We Matter. And what this does is it provides videos and testimonials about sharing uh, stories about surviving you know, attempts at suicide to make kids feel like they're not alone. And when you're in a community of like 300 people that is a flying community, sometimes this is enough to mitigate that risk. And yet, if we're asking platforms to do moderation, this video might pop up as something that is harmful and just get taken down. This is an absolute lifeline for kids in these communities. And there's other services too, right? Like end-to-end -end encrypted messaging services, for example. When we're asking platforms to moderate content, that means you can't do it with end-to-end -end encryption. 
because end-to-end -end encryption means that nobody but the sender and receiver knows what's being shared or communicated. And so, again, we're in a community of 300 people. Maybe there's no mental health counselor in town. Maybe you need to reach out to a, you know, a service provider down south. And, you know, end-to-end -end encryption messaging services or video conferencing services are super critical to make sure that your you know, personal information remains confidential. You can imagine in a community of 300 people, it's really hard to do that without end-to-end -end encryption. And so that's some of the complexities that we see um, that are concerning, but also with respect to, you know, the secure and trustworthy internet that we're hoping to, to get closer to. So I think we fully appreciate the need for encryption, particularly when it comes to things like banking online. Um, but I would point out that there's nothing, at least I can speak for our bill, there's nothing in our bill that requires anybody to break an end encryption. And sometimes it does seem like this is what companies fall back on as sort of a don't look at that, right? We saw that with Earn It and, you know, whether you have good feelings or bad feelings about Earn It, sort of, that's not why I'm here, but um, there's nothing that requires that. I don't really think parental controls that companies are doing on their own in a lot of cases. That's not, you know, requiring somebody to go into anybody's private communications. It's not asking anybody to break end-to-end -end encryption. Um, so, you know, I think there's obviously a need for encryption in certain cases, but these bills don't actually touch that. On the point about, um, I guess, suicide and self-harm content, I know, I think you mentioned a really important point about the delicate balance of, um, you know, people looking and seeking communities to heal from various traumas and then also, you know, training moderators to understand the context around these videos. So, for example, we, um, you know, if someone were to search for suicide content on our platform, we direct them immediately to resources and our community guideline. So we have, like, the link to the suicide national hotline and texting. Um, so, but then, you know, we also have to train moderators to understand the context. So every piece of content that is about suicide isn't necessarily encouraging suicide. It may be encouraging people to seek help. Um, and so being able to identify that um, and then also train and have people, we have over 40,000 people who work in trust and safety at TikTok and they work on like identifying the context around these types of videos. So I think you raise a really good point. People might not have access to resources and they do turn to the internet for things that they just don't have access to in their communities. And so I think that's a really good point you raised. Yeah, and I think that that discussion kind of touches on something that uh, came up in some criticism of COSA and the Age Appropriate Design Code in California of like a, a concern of would these bills unintentionally um, keep certain resources from kids on the internet, um, especially in certain marginalized communities um, by virtue of, uh, you know, maybe certain topics being considered not really age appropriate, but um, there could be resources that are really helpful for kids who are struggling in certain ways. So I guess, does anyone have anything to say about how those concerns can be balanced, um, you know, balancing access to resources and um, access to age appropriate information. Uh, and it, uh, you know, I think the way they've gone about it and the way, um, the appropriate way to do it is you, you link it to accepted standards. You link it to, you know, things the American Academy of Pediatrics with Fodell would, um, you know, define it that way to make sure that it's not like a state AP interpreting what is harmful to mental health. It's, um, you know, medical professionals that are determining that. Is that something that COSA or the California bill have done, or did they leave it more open-ended? And in the, the definition, right, of mental health harms was added to... Yeah, and we've, yes, we've worked to clarify and specify, and those are some of the things that we're still working on cleaning up before introduction. We also have a kids' council that has experts both from companies and the mental health community, um, you know, teens themselves, things like that. And so their job is to work on clarifying sort of the universe um, and, you know, fully appreciate the issue about, I guess, I mean, we wouldn't even call it lawful, but awful, because I don't think that what Natalie was, you know, that's not awful, but, you know, fully appreciate the idea of, you know, 
worrying about over moderation, but at the same time, we're seeing so many cases of under moderation of things like fentanyl sales that are just there and not being caught for whatever the reason that, you know, we, it's just not excusable. Yeah. And I think we talked a bit about parental controls here. And I just wanted to go into that a little bit more. I think a lot of the time we see um, solutions from uh, the tech companies that focus on parental controls, which it seems parents really like the ability to have those options. But at the same time, um, it's really hard for parents who are busy to have to manage one other thing. So um, is there a way to move beyond parental controls? Um, and, you know, how, how can parental controls themselves be made more manageable when we put these kinds of solutions in place? Yeah, we need to move beyond them both because, you know, it's too much for parents and also parental controls assume a healthy parent-child relationship and that's not always the case. So we need to account for that. Um, but the way we move away from parental controls is we force changes to the business practices that are keeping kids online. That's that's the way to do it. I think I've made this point of quite a few times. I do think that, you know, parents do have a role to play in their children's development and their lives and what they want to see online. And I think you do raise a good point about, you know, the fact that there might not be a healthy relationship, but I don't know that we can solve for all the problems um, that parents and children may face. What we can do is give them resources and guidance and the ability to make choices um, that will allow them to be safeguarded. And so I think the parents have a role. I've said it a million times, <laughs> so I won't keep saying it. Um, and I, I think we all do. So um, giving them those tools is something that we work to do. Jane, is this something that you've had experience with at Apple? Um, well, I think that is an area where the device can be very, very helpful. Um, parental controls are on Apple devices. They're behind a, a separate parental login. So if you have your child using the device, you can set the controls and have a separate passcode so your child can't get in. Um, and, I, and I think there's some creative things there that, you know, resources that could come where uh, to educate parents on the type of parental controls for the certain age groups and maybe some of the medical associations and mental health associations could come up with some recommendations for parents. If you have a child between X and Y ages, these are the parental controls you should set. Um, so that's an idea. Yeah, and uh, Derek, did you just any that? Just to maybe build on to that, I think you picked up on a good point is what's age appropriate. Some bills that we're seeing, it's not just for 13 and under, it's up to 17, 18 years old. And when the Internet Society, you know, goes back to its mission in Internet for Everyone, some kids might not have access to the Internet if, say, there are potential parental controls that are preventing them from doing so. And, for example, if, you know, a you know, a teen wants to access information about LGBTQ resources, right, or is discovering their identity online, they might not be able to do so if there are parental controls that might prevent them to do so, unfortunately. And there are lots of other examples like that. So that's just one of the tricky parts um, of some of these bills that, you know, really widen and focus on um, that age range from kids to 80s. And we, in the latest iteration of COSA, did try to distinguish between kids that are at the younger age of that range and the folks that are at the older and have different settings on versus off for certain things, um, recognizing that there might be distinctions and that, you know, there may be different approaches that folks would take with, um, you know, parents and kids for that age. I think more recently we've seen a little bit more discussion and proposals around just banning social media for kids under certain ages, like 16 or whatever the age might be. Um, what do you all think of that sort of discussion? And, um, you know, what is there a certain value of uh, teens being on social media that they might miss out on if they're not allowed access to it at all? I think there's a, there's a lot of value online. I think we talk a lot about the harms and, and we're here to address those harms. 
but there's so much educational content that we now have access to because of the internet. And so I think to say completely banning teens from using a tool that they'll have to use as an adult at some point in their lives as they go on um, and not allowing them to learn how to develop healthy habits online, I think deprives them of like some of the more essential things that they are, they're going to need to do as they grow up. So um, I'm supportive of that. And then even when I think about like the pandemic, how isolated we all were and all of the teens and how else would they be communicating if they weren't ha able to access, you know, online tooling? It's just, you know, we have a responsibility to keep teens safe online, but we also need to enable them with tools to figure out how to manage themselves. I think the other thing that's important to consider is there people use different ways to access the internet and sometimes that's just Facebook. In Northwest Territories, in Canada, Facebook is super popular, especially for communities that are spread out across this giant territory. That is how we talk to grandma. That is how we stay in, in touch with our loved ones in communities that are thousands of kilometers away. So blanket banning social media, I'm not, there's no silver bullet, right? I think that we just have to be mindful that there are different ways to access the internet and there's no one thing that we can do to mitigate harm. It's going to take a holistic approach that involves education, that involves consideration for how people are accessing the internet um, and, and that we're all contributing to. I also think you have a definitional problem. How do you define social media? Is social media now a chat group where you have 20 people in a chat? Uh, I mean, I think and, and bands don't generally work people and kids are really good at getting around band so um i think people have asked my boss this already because other senators have had bills about this um i think you know our view is that it's i know that's a family decision and that's between kids and their parents to figure out um but you know the thing that i will say is that parents are drowning in all of this and you know we did cosa because so many parents and physicians and teachers came to us and said, we don't know what to do here. We're lost and our kids are lost and we don't know what to do. So, no, I don't think that it's the government's role to outright ban them from doing it. And I don't think that that, as Jane said, would work. But at the same time, they they need help. Yeah. And I mean, I think we've already seen some governments try to ban TikTok, of course. I mean, have we seen any impacts on kids yet? Um, from those efforts, or is it too early to say? Well, we're still here. Um, okay, the top up to that. So, um, I, I, my colleague Will will be talking a lot more about this at 4 p.m. So, if anybody else wants to talk about it, they have questions. <laughs> feel free. Um, but we're happy to to talk more about it. I mean, um, we have a community of people who over 100 million users at TikTok who love using the app, who learn, who have built their small businesses up. And it would really be a shame if TikTok were banned. Um, mm -hmm. And I'm not just saying this because I work there. I love I love the app and I, I, I feel committed to the mission. So we should probably ban TikTok. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> well, <laughs> Looking uh, a little bit outside of the U.S., I, I know that uh, COSA looked to the U.K. Uh, online safety bill. Um, uh, Jamie, could you talk a little bit about the U.K.'s model and, um, you know, where we are in relation to the U.K. and maybe other parts of Europe? Yeah, I mean, I'm not going to get into all the details, but it's... You know, it's similar to COSA, but it's broader than COSA, which if you put it in context of them having the GDPR, right, it sort of was an outgrowth of GDPR. Um, my boss recently actually met with the member of parliament, um, MP Kidron, who was sort of the person pushing um, the UK online child's code. So um, it's a little bit broader, right? Like they do get into um, some of the issues of like not processing data in ways that are detrimental to kids. Um, they talk about sort of different data protection principles. And once again, you know, I think it's broader because it is an outgrowth in GDPR and sort of talks about how GDPR in particular is going to be applied 
to kids and to teens. Um, and that, you know, I think GDPR and what happens with GDPR sort of here is a broader conversation that we could sit for another hour and talk about. So, uh, you know, I think we were left with the view of, yes, I think that we have many similar viewpoints here and what they've done in the UK is, you know, in many ways helpful, but at the same time, you know, I don't know that that model is always going to work in the US. So we're trying to do it our own way. And one other critical difference is the UK is on the UN uh, Declaration for the Rights of the Child. So there's an actual definition, uh, and the rest is not, uh, there's an actual definition of best interests of the child that they can follow in their legislation, whereas we don't have that. Yeah. It, it, so I guess, is are the other aspects of the UK bill places where the U.S. might grow or expand on these efforts in the future? Or, you know, Jamie, are there certain things that make it much more, you know, not really an American type of law um, that we would ever really see here? I just don't see it. And, you know, in no way am I looking to sort of denigrate their efforts, right? I think that, like I said, we have similar similar goals in mind. But yeah, it's a very UK focused law, right? It's the place where GDPR came from and it's a very GDPR focused thing. And so I just don't see us sort of going down that road. Um, but yeah, there's a lot of conversations still to be had about sort of how does the US compete on the international stage? Well, they have GDPR, we have nothing. So, you know, there's always that hole, but I just don't know that I see us moving to adopt that model to fill it. Something I hope, but I don't know that that's it. The state bills are really close to it. The California Age Appropriate Design Code is fairly close to the UA, UK one. Um, and then you're seeing that proposed one in Oregon, Maryland, Minnesota. Uh, don't quote me on this Nevada and Mexico, maybe, this session? Or uh, if those plus two might be mixed up. <laughs> but in Etiquette, Texas just dropped like a Cosa Plus. It was interesting with a private right of action. Who did? Texas. Oh, that's wonderful. Okay. And then on the other hand, you saw Utah with the uh, terrifying law pass last session that's going to the, or last week that's going to the governor's desk um, that goes too far. It requires parental access to all of minors' communications. Um, so, uh, yes, but uh, that's not on opposite at the same level. <laughs> yeah. it, I guess we have seen this discussion about. Um, you know, industry saying that having too many state laws will really make it difficult for us to do business across the country. Um, are we already seeing those effects? Like, is it how difficult is it already to operate in different states that might have different uh, regulations around online privacy or online safety for kids? Well, I think it, it can be challenging because right now, we're seeing all of these states pop up with different laws and there'll be different requirements, right? Um, and so how do you make sure that the standards are either applied across the board? Do you do you, do you um, decide the most stringent law is the law that you will apply? Do you, uh, so, you know, I think it's hard because now we'll have a patchwork of rights distributed across the U.S. and it would be great if we had something comprehensive. As I said, everybody in the U.S., every child in the U.S. has these rights and these protections. It would be it's much easier from a business standpoint to implement that, um, but you know we'll have we have to with all of the state bills that are coming up, and it makes sense that they're legislating. It's their job to protect their citizens. Um, you know we have to think about okay, well, how do we apply this law to this population, or do we apply to everyone? So it, it, it starts to be a little challenging, especially if laws are in conflict with each other, or different, or one goes way further than another. It's hard to sometimes to go navigate. And then you just compound it. If you're a global company, you've got the United States to grapple with from a compliance standpoint. And then we are seeing, I mean, across the board, privacy laws being passed, and they're all not consistent at all. Um, and I think it is interesting to look at what happened in Europe. I mean, in 1995, they passed the directive. It was a directive to every member state to pass a privacy law. Well, it turned out each member state passed a different, you know, somewhat the same, but somewhat different privacy law. And it was impeding the free flow of data across the European Union. So that was one of the drivers of the GDPR. Of course, it was a fundamental right to privacy as well. 
but they wanted to ensure the same level of protection across the entire European Union. So that's why they passed a regulation which requires every member state to enact the same law. And so we in the U.S. are kind of taking the directive approach in, in a haphazard way. So I think if we could get a very strong omnibus privacy law, that would, of course, increase the free flow of data and make it easier from a compliance standpoint for businesses. But I just want to call out a little bit that industry is complaining about a patchwork of state laws. At the same time, they're pushing weak state privacy laws in many states. Uh, I don't know if anyone from Amazon is here, but I'm going to call it Amazon and say that, that you know, the markup, investigative materials at the markup showed uh, that, you know, Amazon lobbyists pushed the Virginia Consumer Privacy, Consumer Data Privacy Act, or uh, I think that's the acronym, um, you know, a couple of years ago, and they're pushing that model in many states. It went through in a matter of weeks, uh, and it does very little for privacy. So, you know, they're trying to get all these weak state privacy laws passed in order to lower the bar at the federal level, but let be passed. Uh, at the same time, they're complaining about a patchwork of state laws. Are there certain hallmarks of what would be a weak state privacy law? Like when you see a bill that leaves out certain things or says, you know, certain keywords, does that tell you this is probably not what it's supposed to be? Basically, if it only provides users the ability to know what companies are collecting about them without limiting what companies can collect about them at all, like just provides those user rights without any forced changes to the business practices. Yeah. So, so when you're working at a company and trying to figure out how to implement laws across different states, like how do you decide, you know, are we just going to implement this standard across all of our operations or we're going to limit to a certain geographic area? I guess that question is for me. Um, I would say that we it really just depends on what the law says and how it applies and where else it applies. So I, I think there are various different laws that are popping up. We mentioned this, um, and it really depends on what the provisions are. Um, but I think it's easier for companies a lot of times to take one approach and say, okay, this the strongest law is the one that we're applying across the board, because we don't always know where people live. So you could be a California resident. I spent time, I used to live in California. I now live in DC and I still say that I, I'm a California resident sometimes to get CCPA rights. I'm not going to lie. <laughs> but we don't, you know, we don't always know. Um, and we don't really necessarily need to know, right? Um, and so it's, it's hard because otherwise we have to think about where people live in a way that we don't necessarily want to do. And where would the different platforms pull that information of like where your base is? Is it based on where you currently are? Is it based on where, I don't know, you fought your phone or... I think that's that's challenging too, right? So like TikTok doesn't collect um, direct G GPS location. So you may be, and I travel a lot too. So, I mean, I think it could be determined by where the device is bought or, you know, IP address, but I think it really depends. Um, and, you know, you have to really ask that, ask for that information, I guess, to comply with the law. Yeah. Sure. I think that there's also another perhaps unintended consequences or another outcome is that services could decide to not offer service in certain locations. So we at the Internet Society have a little bit more of a global perspective on this. But for example, with the UK online safety bill, which opposes a duty of care, that means that service providers have to moderate content and in effect can't use end to end encryption. Lots of service providers have decided not to offer a service when second grade security for users if that bill becomes law because they're not willing to do that and, and to take that responsibility. And so that is it's another potential outcome as well. Um, Pull out. <laughs> um, I think even short of seeing some of these bills, um, become law. We've already seen companies taking action, like uh, Dio mentioned, trying to proactively um, meet some of these new standards that are being discussed or figure out new ways to um, protect kids on their platform. Um, so I'm just curious how any of you have seen maybe even just the discussions of these regulations pushing the industry um, to make changes, or do you think it has fallen short of that so far? 
Well, I'd certainly say it's fallen short. I think, you know, um, this experiment's been going on for 20 plus years. I think, you know, we know self-regulation doesn't work. And it's helpful for businesses too to have certainty. You know, startups that are just starting out, they know what rules to comply with, they know the rules of the road, and they're competing in the same rules of the road as, as the big tech company. So it provides certainty for businesses at the same time. It protects privacy. So we've seen a lot of companies that will roll out changes in advance of a hearing or advance of a bill drop. And then in some cases, those changes don't actually end up getting implemented. So, you know, I think for us, it's a lot of too little, too late, um, which is why we're going to keep going on this. Um, you know, for example, we saw last year that Instagram came to us and said, OK, great. Well, we're going to make all of the profiles for minors private be by default. And then lo and behold, they weren't. But they said it in advance of a hearing so they could put out the press release in advance of the hearing. And so, you know, good. I mean, if the companies want to start implementing changes, great. But, you know, for us, it's like, OK, this feels like the least you could do. And you're doing it because this is public. Yeah. Yeah. And I guess just to wrap up, I'll go down the line. Um, if Congress could pass one thing to most protect kids' online privacy and safety, what would it be? And um, what's one thing that industry should do right away to better protect uh, kids online? Um, and maybe I'll start with Jamie. How's that spelling? <laughs> a pretty obvious answer no. to you. Yeah, what can they do? <laughs> um, I don't know, be better about taking down the actual like illegal things that parents have tried and tried and tried to report so you know my boss doesn't have to continue taking meetings with parents whose kids have died from fentanyl being sold on platforms things like that yeah i i am still uh convinced that an omnibus privacy law comes first and then second would be because i don't think they're exclusive i think then uh, looking at the children's uh, online safety code, because you look at the UK, UK has GDPR as a backstop to protect privacy as as they're implementing some of these requirements. Um, and then uh, what could they do better? I, I think, again, I, I tend to agree with you on some of the harmful content, but I think they need to do it across the board. You know, it's not just children. I would echo um, comprehensive privacy uh, privacy legislation in the U.S. that has strong children's protections is something that um, would improve our ability to protect teens, for sure. Um, I would also say that, um, you know, as platforms, we understand that there are harms and we understand that we have a responsibility and we're constantly working to improve. And so, um, you know, as we continue to improve, we'll, we'll do what we can to make sure that teens are safe online because you don't we don't want to see those headlines. I'm not sure we have enough time for me to list off all the things that big thing this industry should be doing differently. So I might just pass on that one. Um, but the best thing we think Congress can do to protect kids online is to pass a comprehensive privacy law like the American Data Privacy Protection Act that includes strong data minimization rules that has heightened protections for kids. So it's addressing those kids' issues, but it's setting a culture of privacy in the U.S. that's just missing right now. So I'm going to give a vaguer response. Um, more privacy for everyone, the more we get towards a secure and trustworthy internet, and the more that we can make sure that the internet actually is for everyone. And that involves not undermining encryption or incentivizing companies to undermine encryption because it is a crucial way that people can control their own privacy and protect their data. Well, thank you all so much for being part of this discussion, and thank you all for joining us. Thank you. Thank you.